I'm at, uh, we're in Maida Vale BBC Studio, Studio One, and we're rehearsing um, this piece I wrote in collaboration with Rob Ryan, the author, and uh, it's a piece called That Obscure Herp, and we're doing it for the Oldborough Festival as part of their centenary um, celebrations of Benjamin Britten. The way the idea for the piece came from, because I did a, uh, some music a few years ago called DZF, which was a reimagining of Mozart's magic flute, and Rob Ryan, again, he rewrote the story of the magic flute and set it in New York in the 50s and made it a kind of sort of film noir, Mickey Spillane type version of it. And we performed it at Oldborough, and Oldborough liked it. And then when it was Benjamin Britten's centenary coming up, they asked if I'd like to do a similar thing with Benjamin Britten. And I said, yes, it would be great, and it's a great challenge, but this is a totally different thing. Um, Mozart's operas are, are amazing and they're quite comical as well and somebody once described the magic flute to me as like a pantomime for grown-ups um, who was a classical music critic told me that actually and, and I just thought you know Benjamin Britten is a totally different kettle of fish he's a it's a he's a an amazing man but his music um, I'd have to approach this very seriously and I spoke with Rob to if he could to ask him if he could help me out with it, and we went through so many different connotations of what we should do and what we shouldn't do, and and, and we threw so many ideas into the bin because we just didn't like them and didn't think they would work. Um, and as with the the Mozart piece, that we knew the rule one was you don't touch any of the music at all. You just mustn't do that. So, in the end, um, we were looking at the title of the series, and the series was called Inspired by Britain. And um, so Rob said, well, why don't we look at what inspired him and go to that same source? And we, we looked at a whole number of things. And we, we, looking at, we were looking at his, at his operas, and we turned to Owen Wingrave and The Turn of the Screw, which we found out were uh, based on Henry James ghost stories. So Rob found another Henry James ghost story that he thought he could do some things with and it was a piece called The Jolly Corner and uh, so he he knew that I had a symphony orchestra and a big band so obviously there was going to be a jazz element as well as the symphonic element and so he he reset the story that in the original book The Jolly Corner is an old house in New York that is handed down the father who owns it hands it down to his son and the son sells it and uh, Rob has turned the house in New York into a jazz club in Soho. And apart from that, it's all the same story, really. Uh, and then he would, he wrote down all the titles, everything that was going on, and he gave it a backstory uh, to get the whole thing going. Because um, apart from looking at that tu that um, that book, that story, um, Rob also wanted to look at what inspired Britain and what the what things that were admired for if you like by Britain like for example he had uh, he had, we know he has a great love of the sea um, he made a very important trip to the to America as a conscientious objector um, he you know his his operas like uh, um, he loves the outsider you know like Peter Grimes and um, oops, what's that he, he loves the, <laughs> he loves the outsider like Peter Grimes um, and all these elements, and so what Rob did was, he said, okay, well, the father in the story who owns the house, who hands it back to the son, let's give him a story. And so he, he made this guy a drummer on the boats in the 40s that, that used to take people like John Dankworth and, and uh, Stan Tracy and um, Ronnie Scott, when they used to go and join the dance band on the Queen Mary playing foxtrots and waltzes, which they weren't really crazy about doing, but the whole point of the journey was that they would get off the other end and have a free trip to go to New York and go to 52nd Street and see all those amazing musicians. So what Rob did was made the father in this story the, the drummer in that band, and he goes over to New York, sees this amazing music in the club, and he brings it back to London, and that's where he builds he builds his jazz club in Soho and it's called the Jolly Corner and from then on it does the same thing you know so ghosts and all sorts. Thing is that because I looked at the story and it and it and it it's in the 40s 
there's a bit where they remember the club in its heyday in the 60s, it, its present day. So whenever those, those periods appear, um, I felt that you're not, there's not enough time to explain everything to the audience. We've got programme notes, but so it's best if, when we are in that era, I make sure that the music does sound just like that era. So, you, you know, it's like a, it's like a bit of time travelling, really. Mm. When I started writing it, people were saying, oh, well, if you're going to do some music that's inspired in any way uh, by Britain, or what's inspired him, obviously you've got to have songs. And I said, no, no, we're not going to have any songs. And then we'd had, with DZF, we had an American actor narrate the story. And I said, Rob, we're not going to have any narration. None at all. And then I thought, as I was writing it, I thought, actually, you know what? It would be quite nice to have a song. And there's a moment at the end where the, uh, you know, the guy who's been handed the, the, the jazz club, this guy Spencer Bryden, there's a moment when he he's lost alone in the club and it's night and he's just been scared to, to, to pieces by a phantom that's chased him around the club and and he, he, he comes to from all this and and Rob had explained there's this moment where he's discovered all these old uh, cans of films and he puts them on and they're old films of his father and he remembered that his you know his dad loved America and loved going there and loved the musicians and the music that came from and so I said well actually wouldn't it would be nice to have a kind of song but right there one that sounds like an American songbook type song you know so I started writing it and played with some ideas and eventually I was I got to a point and I just remember landing on a certain chord and I heard Kurt's voice in my head literally I, it was like I just thought how this should go and then I just said well there's, there's only one voice that I really want to hear doing this it should be Kurt so um, and that was it from that point I said well why don't I just ask him I mean what's the best thing to do and I sent him a text and he sent me, sent me a text back saying well if it's Benjamin Britain he said I'm not really I don't really do opera what do you I said, so I said it's not it's not opera and then I called, I've worked with Kurt a few times and he's a really incredibly special man. Uh, he's, he's the most amazing singer and he's also the most amazing human being. You know, he's, he's the perfect combination. Uh, couldn't wish for more. And he said yes. So, so then it became obvious. I said, OK, well, he needs more than... If, if, if Kurt's going to do it, we should write some more songs. So we wrote four vocal sections, one that allows him to uh, have some moments of scat in a, a bebop piece and then three songs and we reprise one when it comes back and that, so that was all happening and then I thought about the piece in a whole and I thought about the Olbra audience and, and there was a section in the about the th halfway uh, towards the beginning I think but the third piece in that Rob sent me a title it was in darkness and it's a it's a moment in the story where the guys who are watching the CCTV cameras of the jazz club discover see that there's something going around in a phantom and I was again reminded of a a, a fantastic thing that William Burroughs recorded with an orchestra where he he read, ex he read an excerpt from Naked Lunch. And I, so I just went off again. I said, actually, maybe we need another voice. And, um, and I've known Janie for years, and I've seen her play in... seen her perform in many plays by Alan Akebourne and Harold Pinter. And like, she's just an amazingly talented lady. Um, she's a great singer as well, and a great dancer and an amazing actress and her voice is so special so I phoned Rob up again I said right get your pen out again you need to write some more stuff and he did some very interesting stuff based on the um, on Henry James bits but it's all his work and uh, and Janie is just came, came and and what, what she did actually I, I met her in the dressing room of a theatre when she was performing it, it was in between shows on a matinee day and she recited the, the thing into my phone and I had the phone plugged in at home and I wrote the music to her voice so 
to try and get the timings right. Ambitious is a funny word. I don't, I, I always, I never know. It's the most challenging piece I've ever, ever written. And what's Definitely. been challenging specifically? It's about 78 minutes of original music of, that I've, I've had to compose for 75 musicians and a male vocalist and a, an actress. So it was great having Rob's story and Rob, Rob inspiring me with his words and telling me what was going on. Um, but there was a moment right at the very beginning because uh, I, I, I wrote it in four months and I, I remember writing the opening few bars just before Christmas and then just leaving it because I just finished doing a, a couple of big orchestral projects and I just said okay I'll start in January you know like the 3rd of January I'll start and I just remember those first two or three weeks not going very well and I, I got two or three minutes of music and I got stuck and I, I couldn't and it wasn't like a writer's block thing it's just that I didn't like anything I was doing and that just and that was a, a worry but then it sort of gathered a bit more momentum and then it just becomes your obsession and it becomes like every day you can't you know you just have to do, keep doing it and the funny thing is sometimes now when I when we play it and I get to the end of a certain section I, I can't remember writing it you know there are certain sections where I can't remember there's certain sections where I went yeah I remember that I remember the trouble you gave me you know that bit. but um, it, and I'm I always said that Music is, um, when you look at it, it's like a lot of almost meaningless, meaningless dots on a page. And it doesn't mean anything until you put it in the hands of amazing musicians and then they show you how it's supposed to go. And that's what I've got here. I've got some amazing people in the big band and I've got a fantastic orchestra to work. I became involved with this beautiful project because my friend Guy Barker gave me a call and said, Kurt, I'm hearing your voice on this, would you do it? And I said, sure. And then uh, he told me more about what it was. I mean, I you know, when guy calls, I'm happy to, I'm happy to get with him again. He's such a great friend. He's a wonderful writer, and I always know it's going to be, everything's going to be taken care of. And uh, so it's a pleasure. I didn't even really understand what the concept was when I said yes to it, but I trusted him, and now I'm really happy. I'm doubly happy to be a part of it. Well, I mean, first of all, it's always inspiring to me when 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 somebody has the talent and the sit down ability. Uh, and the pen ability to write charts for orchestras and big bands and anything like that. I mean, that's that's just massive. Uh, and then when it all actually sounds really good and it has an emotional impact and it's got a cool story behind it, uh, then it's it's a win for everybody because there's more more mystery and there's more music in the world. Apparently, I'm playing three characters, which I have yet to fully suss out. Uh, there's the there's the guy who's been dead for a while which I probably am the best at playing. Then there's the guy who is his son, and now there's the guy who owns the jazz club who's supposed to be closing it down, and then he has a change of heart overnight. So I brought along very minimal, you know, I'll wear a tie for the guy from the 1950s, and then I'll wear no tie, and then because the third guy's supposed to be having been grown, having grown up in, in the UK, then, I'm, I'm, then I'll wear an ascot for the third, for the third young man. <laughs> well, you know, I've written a bunch of things like this, although not for orchestra, uh, uh, and things that have been more uh, geared toward the dramatic arts that include music. I've done that several times in Chicago for the Steppenwolf Theater. Um, so it's not completely foreign to me by any stretch. Uh, challenges. Well, it was a challenge to be on the road uh, for the entirety of the time that I've had the music and with no piano at my, <laughs> at my fingers, so that I, you know, it's been hard to... It's been a challenge to learn some of the stuff, the musically speaking, uh, but thankfully Guy sent along some great demos, so I was able to look and listen at the same time, but I wasn't able to get to a piano. Um, so I'm at about, you know, I'm in the 92% area for where we are now, but uh, by the time the performance comes, I hope to say I'll be ready for it. So far, meeting Jeannie is a great thing. That's the actress's name, right? Man, she's a dream come true. What a beautiful voice wonderful attitude she reads the stuff like it's meant to be i i can't believe she hasn't done audiobooks because she is so lovely to hear and she's such a sweet person so that's a great that's a big surprise uh 
and then just you know it's always a big surprise just in a general way when you hear little demo little MIDI files and then you hear an actual orchestra playing the stuff it's 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 just remarkable it's just a great it's a great revelation it's gonna be great new music for a new audience an educated uh, music listening audience uh, something that has some historical ties and yet is a new jazz experience uh, there's no downside to it uh, Rob Ryan and Guy Barker had discussed what they wanted to do which was probably last year uh, maybe October November and because because Guy had told me about this idea they had for Britain's tribute which was to marry Henry James ghost stories with his his operas, um, and, or rather characters in them, to make a new story and indeed a new symphony, a jazz symphony. And I said, so, you know, where do I fit in? And he said, well, I'm going to show you. You know, and he came up, I was doing Hello Dolly, <laughs> and he came to speak to me about this beautiful piece of work that Rob had written. So I read it, uh, and it was, well, it was really disturbing and beautiful at the same time. What was disturbing about it? Uh, I guess because he's playing with past and future. Um, and it, for me, it doesn't just stop at this particular relationship. It's a bit bigger than that. So although we're looking specifically at a relationship between a man and woman um, and the journey they go on and the sacrifices she makes over the years that he never knows about and then ultimately he realizes and it saves him knowing that somebody cared about him that much but it's uh it's very it's done very lightly and um with great deft of pen so you know by the time you get to the end it's that that moment i think that really hit me just now when i was rehearsing with the whole orchestra that it's it's actually really huge and uh prophetic moments about the world, I feel, in it. I'm playing two characters. Uh, I, I asked Rob, is this all the same woman? He said, well, not really. You know, the first the first time that you speak, you are uh, Jennifer Muldoon, who is sort of psychic, uh, but doesn't believe. She's very, very jaded about what people see, what they say they see, but she sees something that he sees, which is his his past and there's something in it something in it for me about the first world war I felt that and then I mentioned it and they went oh well we were gonna do something about the first world war and then we decided not to that we'd keep it jazzy but I've, I've known Guy and I've watched his work for well at least 12 years maybe more and he he has this ability to um, well, he's, he's loved the film, the nostalgia of the film world, and he can absolutely create that with an orchestra, and you almost feel like you are watching a film when his pieces are being played. Uh, it's got a quality and narrative to it anyway. Um, and so, you know, I sort of forget because I'm listening to all these amazing sounds, and then he'll go into something really funky, and I want to dance because he's just, you know, he's got, he's got his... Um, antenna in lots of different places and he brings it all to his work so yeah it's uh, it's very exciting to be either in the audience which I've been many times to listen to his work or absolutely in the middle of it this is my first time right in the middle of it uh, and it's a wonderful feeling um, he didn't write any underscoring bars for me so I'm literally as I feel it speaking with the occasional nod from him to say that's okay you're in the right place but it's totally gut which it's you know as a musician myself I never ever do that as an actress I do but I don't usually have to act to music without knowing what brings me in or what the, you know what the tempo is or you know if you're singing but now I, I kind of it's scary but so far we've been okay so we'll see this afternoon in the run if it still works I'm I mean, working on it alone at home, you know, and getting, realising what I think it means to me, and that's a treat to be allowed to interpret something, mm. you know. That's lovely. So, yeah, that, 
and also always, you know, talking to Guy and going through it with him and watching him bubble with his enthousiasm. You know, it's it's uh, it's joyous. It is joyous. All of it.